Oh, Mr. You said no sound. You can hear me now? Because it must be on your ear. Okay, y'all. So with that being said, anticoagulation is not to clot. Stop from clotting. It's against clotting. So whatever tube you have, which I will demonstrate on this weekend, you may have a tube that's an anticoagulation tube versus a tube that is a coagulation. Coagulation means it's supposed to clot. So if you draw my blood, you invert it, the, the, the blood is flowing in the tube. But if you set it and let it sit for 30 minutes to an hour, when you pick it back up, it's going to be a tube of clotted blood. And that's okay because that tube was supposed to do that, okay? I just need you to ponder on anticoagulation and coagulation for this weekend. Anti, if you think of anti, it means no, stop, versus coagulation, there's nothing in front of it. So it is meant to clot. Anticoagulation, no clotting, coagulation, clotting, okay? So that was the main part that I did not get to on Tuesday. I know that we have personal protective equipment down here, but on this weekend, we're going to get into that, okay? We should know by now it's equipment to protect us, which involves gloves, gown, mask, face shield, or goggles, because they're the same thing. But I will show you demonstration on this on Sunday, actually. Um, but anticoagulation versus coagulation, okay? All right, now moving forward, we talked about the order of draw on Sunday. I did go over each order of draw or each blood tube, vacutane or tube. You were able to match it up with your two page blood tube paper versus also looking at the requisition at the same time, okay? So what I wanna do is go over a little bit more of the order of draw, just to get our minds going, okay? <clears throat> All right, so this is my whiteboard of my order of draw. Uh, I'm gonna move my page over, which is the same page that you all have. I'll, I'm sharing my screen, I'll be able to do it, okay? So these are my little boxes I have. Right about now at this point, you can start uh, figuring out like, oh, how I'm gonna make my study note when it's time for me to get this down. Because remember, I did explain to you that the order of draw is a bulk of phobotomy. And when you're done with my class, you may get hired at a plasma center or you may get hired at a blood bank, which they're not considered a full-fledged lab because they are only for plasma and blood donations. So they don't go by the order of draw because they, they're not a full lab. You're not gonna go, you're not gonna have a, a patient or a person to walk into a blood bank and say, oh, um, I'm sick, you know, I need you guys to do a CBC and a, a check my thyroids and check for me for diabetes. You know, they're not gonna say that in a blood bank. You're simply going there to donate blood, okay? So that's the only thing that you may have to brush up later in working in a full lab. But remember, they're gonna put you through their your own training when you do. But the order of draw is a, a, a very important um, aspect of phlebotomy and you will be tested on it on your exam to be certified, okay? So first thing is first, um, over here in my little corner, we talked about blood cultures. Um, I showed you the blood culture bottles. Um, we're gonna do uh, special collections tonight and uh, the blood cultures is gonna be a part of special collections because you can already probably uh, tell that why are they bottles in the first place? How in the world do we collect blood from, to these bottles, right? So these are your uh, examples of your blood culture bottles. We should already know right now that these blood cultures are gonna go to the microbiology lab because it's blood cultures. That means that the doctor already suspects that the patient has an infection. He or she needs to know what the bacteria is and what medication that will help them. 
The reason why, ladies, it's two bottles, it's always going to be two bottles, except for children. But right now, let's talk about adults. It's always going to be uh, two bottles. So if you get an order from the doctor that says blood culture times one, that just means that you need to collect a blood culture that consists of two bottles, but only one time. Sometimes the doctor may order blood culture times two. So if the doctor does that, that means you stick me and you draw my blood culture, both bottles, and then you have to stick me again in a separate place and use the other two bottles. No matter what, it's always going to be two bottles, okay? So if the doctors say blood culture time two, then you do blood culture time two. But I will give you guys a little insight. Until you work in a hospital, you won't see too much of blood cultures. They are predominantly being in a hospital working as a phlebotomist there, okay? Because they are, you know, sick already, and they are just main, uh, main known. Now, if you do work in a Quest lab core or full a full phone blown lab, you know, don't be surprised if you get it. I'm just letting you know that you see it more often in the hospital. So these two bottles, one is aerobic, one is anaerobic. As you can see, one is blue. One is red, and you see anaerobic, A-N-A-E-R-O-B-I-C versus aerobic, A-E-R-O-B-I-C, okay? So let me tell you, what it means is that when you put blood in that tube and it goes to the micro, I mean, in the bottles, and it goes to the microbiology lab, it's going to sit and grow like I explained cultures do. But what happens is, is that one bottle the additive that's in there has oxygen and the other additive don't, okay? So what it is is that the aerobic additive, this little fluid that you see in there, which is the aerobic, that has oxygen versus the anaerobic fluid or additive doesn't have oxygen. So the doctor, these blood cultures are very, very important. That's how you get if you know, someone has whatever the bacteria that it has. It needs to be tested tested with oxygen and without. That's why it's always two bottles, okay? What you need to know is that when you do draw your blood, it tells you, you guys kind of see, let me see if I can make it bigger. You see more so on the anaerobic bottle, it has five milliliter, five milliliter, five milliliter, five milliliter down there, right? That means that five milliliters of blood is going to go in this bottle. If you thought that you was going to fill this whole bottle up until it's full with blood, no. It's just five mLs need to go in each bottle. So together, you need 10 milliliters of blood, okay? So how would you know that? You see that the where the, the uh, uh, let me explain it properly. You see where the label stops? right here at the blue and right here at the red, when, I mean, at the pink. When you put blood in there, rather you're using the straight needle or rather you're using the butterfly, once it actually on the clear part of the bottle that you can see through, when the blood goes up to the, this third five milliliters, you put five milliliters of blood in there. Same for the blue bottle. Did I lose anyone? Because this tape, or the measurement is only just on part of the bottle. So when you turn the bottle around, it'll be clear and you will be able to put blood in there until the level rise up to that, to the next five milliliter. It's, that's the actual measurement. So right here where the, the pink stops, that lets you know that's how much of the anaerobic fluid that's in there. So when you put blood in there, it's just gonna rise up to this one here and that's all you need. And you will be able to see that on the part of the bottle that you can see. And I will reiterate it again on Saturday in front of you. Um, but, but just to kind of explain that, it's always going to be two bottles, an anaerobic one and an aerobic one. Aerobic is with oxygen. Anaerobic is without oxygen. The anaerobic and aerobic, um, from what I know, it you know you may get one question if you even get a question on a national exam. 
but I don't need you to go out in the real world and then look at blood culture bottles and be like, what is this? I've never seen these in my life. Okay, so my explanation of instruction is to get you guys familiar with it so you will know that it's a such thing. And not only that, when you look at your order of draw, blood cultures are first in that order if the doctor ordered it. Okay. Let's just say the doctor only ordered blood cultures and nothing else. Okay. Then you just draw your blood cultures. But I do need you to know what blood cultures are anaerobic, aerobic. Aerobic is with oxygen, anaerobic is without, but you always need both bottles because the, it needs to grow one with oxygen, one without. And all we're putting is five mLs of, bl in bl of blood in each bottle. Okay. So when I'm starting up my whiteboard now, is that, so if I want to type here, I want to put with oxygen versus anaerobic without oxygen. It's always going to be both bottles, okay? And remember five milliliters of blood, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about uh, blood cultures and special collections tonight before we leave, um, but that's really a bulk of it. You know that that's first in the order of draw. So if you see anything that says SPS or sterile, they're talking about blood cultures, okay? You see something that's two little circles, that's because the blood cultures consist of two bottles. All right. Let's move forward, ladies, to our light blue top two. Hopefully we should know, let me flip my paper over to the blue two. So you see, I flip my paper over, which is what you all have in your folders. So right here, our light blue top two, the additive in it is sodium citrate. We invert that to three to five times, three, three to four, three to five times. The most common test is PTINR or PTT. Okay, so on your two page paper, you see I had you circle PTINR and PTT. And another insight that I did give you all is that if you are drawing this light blue top two, the patient is probably on a blood thinner, most likely. because that's the only reason why the doctor's even drawing that, to test the bleeding time. Okay. So when you make your flashcards or make your notes, I don't know if this helps you, um, this is not what I said I was going to tell everyone at the end. This is just in the process while you're learning. I don't know if you're going to make flashcards or if you simply want to just make a four corner box to where you have the color tool, the additive, the inversion time, and the most common test. Whatever it takes for you to, to get the order of drawdown. Light blue top sodium citrate or citrate, patient is on a blood thinner, is testing for the patient's bleeding time. How fast, how slow it comes or how thick or how thin it is. That's what bleeding time means. And that's it with that blue top tube. I will talk to you later about if it's a uh, a, a tube that's meant to clot or not meant to clot. I'll talk to you about that this weekend. Let's just re go back over the order of draw right now. Your quiz tomorrow is the order of draw. All right, so let's go ahead and move to our red tube. Remember our red tube, which stands for serum, 
it is a clot activator too. So with me saying that, if your brain is going and thinking and flowing and bubbling, you probably figuring out like, oh, that must be a coagulation tube because it says clot. It's meant to clot, okay? So on this weekend, I, when we get real blood, I will tell you, okay, draw from the red tube or draw from the, the light blue top tube. I'm, doing the, I'm giving you tubes on purpose. So when we do put it in the spinner machine, you will be able to see with your own eyes the separation, how the blood separates. <clears throat> And that's when we'll talk about serum and plasma, okay? But for now, let's keep going with the order of draw. So remember, our red tube is serum. I put none because remember, it has no additive on, that, uh, on the red one, okay? We do not invert the red tube because we don't have nothing to mix it with. There is no additive in there we can use it as an extra tube if we want it. Typically, like I told you all, if I was working at CLSI, I would tell them, take that red top tube out of the, 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 the equation, but I don't work for them and <laughs> they got it in there. So why did I say that? Remember, red top tube has no additive, it's a serum tube, but technically, in real life, we use the other serum tubes, the serum separator tubes. So we typically grab the, the tiger or the gold top tube instead of grabbing the red one, okay? Remember, the additive that's in the gold or the tiger top is SST, stands for serum separator. My nails is old and then they causing me to. Oh my God. Okay, but you guys, okay, serum separator two. So if someone was to ask you, remember, red is serum. So is your gold and tiger top. They are serum tubes, but they have the gel in the bottom that it stands for serum separator tube. Okay. Do, do, did I lose anyone as far as confusing on between the gold, the tiger top, and the red top? Recording in progress. Oh, wow. oh, wow. How did that happen? I thought I'd been recording. Okay, I don't know what that was all about. Sorry. Hopefully it's recording. Um, so, but the tiger top and the gold top, we do invert. Okay, so with that being said, we do invert that tube, those tubes five times because it has that gel. Um, let me show y'all. Oh, I meant to dang on it. Hold on one second. And I don't want to take too much time because I have a, a more to cover today, but I wanted you to look in your book to see how it is in your book and then you will be able to match it up with what we're gonna see in real life. Hold on. And I just had it uh, before class started and didn't remember the... Uh... Okay, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so on page, if you if you ladies have your book on page uh, 100, you will see what the their diagram of what the blood looks like centrifuge. 
So the jail one, we invert it five times. And then we're going to put typically every tube goes in the centrifuge machine. And that's only because we're preparing it for pickup for the person to take it to the lab. I will talk to you about it. But on your page 100 at the bottom, you will see where the blood separates from the gel. And so now we have serum at the top, the gel separator in the middle, and the whole blood at the bottom. You will be able to see that in real life when we get our real blood on Saturday after we spin it. So I'm just letting you know, having your brain work on why there's even additive. We know that the additive is needed to test the blood, but it needs to mix with the blood before it's the, uh, before the medical laboratory uh, doctor looks underneath the microscope, okay? So back to the serum too. We know that it's third in the order of draw, we know the red has no additive. It's a clock, ad, clock activator tube. We do not invert it. But our other serum tubes, which is serum separator tube, our gold type, our tiger top, SST, we invert them five times. The most common test that you will see in those tubes is your CMP, which is your chemistry profile, complete metabolic panel, or BMP for basic metabolic panel. But the doctors typically don't do basic. They just go ahead and do complete, you know. Don't do basic on me. Do the whole workup, okay? Um, also, hepatic panel. Remember, that's another name for liver. You will see that, especially on all of your, you will be able to tell a person that's getting a physical. Uh, and also lipid panel, okay? Meaning cholesterol. That's the whole cholesterol workup. So those are your most common tests in your SST tubes. BMP, CMP, hepatic panel, lipid panel. Okay. Moving on to our next order of draw, which we have our green tube. Our green tube is our, no matter if it's light or dark green, they are both our heparin tubes. That is the additive that's in there. Remember, it is also a gel. Let me write that. The additive that's in our light green top tubes is a gel, but it is heparin not SST, okay? We do invert the light green top tube eight times. The most common test in our light green top tube is everything that can go in a golden tiger top. It's just that if you draw it in that green top, it is stacked, ASAP, immediately. So therefore, a CMP, a BMP, a hepatic panel, a lipid panel can go in a heparin tube, but it means that it's stat. The doctor wrote STAT on the requisition. So if you have a CMP, then you need to draw it from the green top tube. The next most common test in a green top tube is our ammonia. It goes on ice. We're going to talk about ammonia tonight because it is a special collection. That's what special collection means. It's collected in a special way. It's not your typical other blood test, okay? And the reason why it's even special, you can probably figure out is that because we have to put it on ice. So that's what makes it special. I put therapeutic drug monitoring here that goes um, in a light green top tube, but I have it separated because I just really want you guys to remember that, um, that they are stat testing and your ammonia testings. Any question? Okay. Our green top is fourth in the order of draw. Heparin, invert eight times. 
any labs that are order stacked, which is anything that can go in our tiger top or our gold top can go in our green top, okay? Next in the order of draw, we have our pink or purple tubes, okay? Now, the reason why you, uh, I have pink in, in the training room, uh, but I have to put pink on here. Pink is not, you know, a part of the order of draw, but if you need to draw a pink, it needs to go when you draw the purple. And I'm gonna explain that to you in just a minute. So remember, our purple or lavender tube, lavender and purple means the same. The additive that's in there is EDTA, okay? EDTA is in the uh, purple lavender tube. I put to the side, EDTA is also in our pink tube. I just flipped my page over. It is sprayed and coated with EDTA as well, okay? Now we do, if you do uh, have a pink or a lavender top tube, those are inverted eight times also. The most common test in our lavender top tube is our CBC for complete blood count, is our hemoglobin A1C. The doctor checks out the diabetics every three months. A hemoglobin A1C tells the doctor how your blood sugar has been over a three month period, just from the blood, okay? Also a SED rate is most common, especially if you're gonna work with pediatrics and it's only a test that the doctor is checking out on the babies to see if they have too much lead, too much of anything in their blood, okay? Cause it can affect their immunity, just a little background. But CBC, hemoglobin A1C and SED rate. I kind of have H slash H separated um, because uh, you will see that it stands for hemoglobin and hematocrit. But hemoglobin and hematocrit is inside a CBC. But if a doctor order it separately, that's because he's just trying to focus on if you are anemic or not. He don't need the complete blood count. He just needs to test your hemoglobin and hematocrit. So do you need to really know hemoglobin and hematocrit, study it, you know, go to nursing school? No, but I'm just giving you a little background of H and H and you may see that um, because a lot of doctors ordered that. You probably had that ordered on you before if someone, if one of you ladies are anemic or ever been anemic. Okay. Now, when I flip my page back over, let me kind of go over the pink. The pink tube is an EDTA tube. So preferably, if you worked in the blood bank or if you was working in a hospital, the pink tube is solely for blood banking purposes. So if you told the doctor you are you forgot what blood type you is and you don't have no medical records because you're from Cuba or whatever, you know, I'm just making up stuff. So then that means that the doctor is going to do, you see here, it says type and screen. He's going to want your blood to be drawn so you can know your type, okay? If you um, want an antibiotic screening, like how, kind of how what people was getting done for COVID, it will go in a P2. All of these tests just telling us that these are for blood bank only, cross match. You are, you typed and screened for what type of blood you are, but the cross match mean what other blood types work for your blood if you needed a blood transfusion. Okay, so at the top of your page, you will see where it says blood bank armband must be completed and attached to the pink top tube um, when we're doing that. And that's something that you will be trained for, but it's more in particular because when you draw that, you, you give the patient a band. I don't know if anyone has ever had a blood transfusion or maybe thought that you needed one and they drew your blood and they put an extra special band on your wrist to where your that band has to match the blood that you get because it's very particular. 
as a phlebotomist, no, you don't give the transfusion, the nurses do, but that is an extra step of identification. But all I need you to know is that the pink top tube is for the blood bank purposes only, the pink top tube. It has EDTA. So if you have a, a, a requisition that say type and screen, then you get your pink tube out. And if you have other tubes, then you'll just draw it when you draw your lavender top. Because it has the same additive, it don't matter if you draw the purple or pink first, just long as you draw it in that order, okay? Did I lose anyone on with that? Okay, all right, let's move forward. Last in the order of draw we have is our gray top two, okay? Let me flip my page over again. Our gray top two, you see gray and that gray is a little light, but our gray top tube is last in the order of draw. Oxalate is the additive. Te technically, the additive is um, sodium fluoride potassium oxalate. It's like four words, but just remember it, study it by oxalate. Remember, always look at your label on your tubes, okay? Do not get our blood gray tube mixed up with our urine culture gray tube. Okay. Now we do invert it eight times also. So if anything that you have noticed, the last three tubes in the order of draw are all inverted eight times. So light blue top tube three to four times, SST tubes five times, the rest of them eight times. And you will have inversion questions on your national exam. Okay. Now, the most common test in our gray top two is our- Recording in progress. Okay. That is nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. That's me. I'm sorry. I had to get off and come back on. My phone was stuck. <laughs> oh, that's what it's doing. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right. I'm just trying to be sure my whole thing is recording. So it is. It's just if somebody go off. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, so with the gray top tube, the most uh, common test is your fasting glucose level. It doesn't have to be precisely fasting, but if it, if it is a glucose level, it still goes in the gray top tube, rather it's fasting or not. So I don't want to confuse you guys. So on your requisition, if you're going to look at it later, if you're looking at it now, um, if you see glucose, it's going to say G-R-Y or G-Y or G or whatever. And it stands for gray top two. Okay. The next most common test is lactic acid. And it also goes on ice. Okay. Gray top two, last in order of draw. Oxalate is the additive. We invert eight times. It's a glucose level and a lactic acid on ice. How was it on ice when it's not stacked? Because wouldn't the ice melt? So the ice would melt, but because that one needs to go in that additive too, oxalate. So in other words, good question, it's still, it's still sorta need to get to the lab as soon as you can, unless you're, you guys have, uh, uh, what do you call it, dry ice and have to keep it on ice over and over and over or refrigerated or whatever the case may be. So good question, everything in green means stat, everything on ice still should mean stat, but it just means keep it on ice until it gets to the lab. But that lactic acid, that particular test, needs to go in a gray top tube with the sodium fluoride potassium oxalate additive. So that's why it doesn't go in the heparin tube. And if you notice, when I did talk about ammonia that goes on ice, I never really specified like because it's on ice is the reason why it's stacked. It just goes in a green top tube, but it has to be transported on ice. 
but all of your other tests that can go on the SST tube, if you put it in the green top tube, that means that it's stacked. So it's kind of like just using your judgment and then whatever uh, orientation your job puts you through with things that needs to be transported on ice, they'll let you know like what is the appropriate protocol for your facility. Now, if you are a mobile phlebotomist working for a company, go from house to house or nursing home to nursing home, I don't know if they're going to tell you after every collection, if you have something that needs to be on ice, take it immediately to the lab. I don't know. Or they may give you a cooler again that has dry ice in it, but they'll be able to, you know, uh, orientate you to that. But that was a good question. Okay. Now, this is your order of draw. You have your blood culture tubes, okay? You have your light blue top tube that has sodium citrate in it, okay? Um, oh, I just messed up on that one. But um, then you have your, your red tube, which is your serum tube, but it's a clock activator. It doesn't need to be inverted. It doesn't have an additive. But you have your other serum tubes that have an additive in it, which is SST. Okay, we invert those five times. The most common drug, uh, the most common test I want you to uh, remember because on the exam, you're going to see it. It's because it's the most common test. I don't want you to be like, golly, you know. So try to put your order or draw, you know, however, if you're going to use boxes or if you're going to use one line to get your mind in the way of remembering it. And like I said, you're going to be, your, your, your knowledge is going to be tested, not only on the order of draw by the color of the tube, but by the attitude. They'll ask you, okay, according to the listed below, what is correct of the order of draw? And they're going to give you citrate, heparin, EDTA, and mix it all up. So you need to also memorize or study the order of draw per the additive also, not just per the color of the tube. Okay, remember, next in the order of draw is our green. It's heparin, it does have a gel. We invert it eight times. Any labs that is order stacked from our, our chemistries, from the mobile, uh, mobile, from the marble and SST tubes, the gold tubes. Remember, I think I stated gold, this is gold, not yellow. Okay, because in some labs that's doing research and things, there is a such thing as a yellow top tube. So don't confuse that with yellow. It's gold. <clears throat> Ammonia also goes in a green top tube and it is delivered on ice the moment that you collect it. I will demonstrate to you in person when everybody gets their own biohazard bag for when we do our live draws, I will explain to you the, how the bag goes because I don't know if you noticed, but you got one main zipper part and then you got an extra pocket on the side of the bag. So I will explain to you how, you know, all of that is packaged. All right, next in the order of draw is our EDTA tubes, whether it's purple lavender or pink. Our purple lavender, is where our remain CBC, hemoglobin A1C, send rate. Our pink is only used for blood banking purposes to know what blood type you are and what's your uh, positive, negative, meaning your RH factor, you know, what blood type will go best with your blood if you ever needed a transfusion. We invert those tubes eight times. Gray is last in the order of draw, oxalate. We invert it eight times. The most common test to remember is your glucose level, rather it's fasting or not. But the reason why fasting is important is typically the doctor will not have a, a good estimate of your blood sugar unless it was fasting. Okay. So most of the time, cholesterol and glucose will number one be your fasting two test because he don't want you to go to long. On John Silver's or a, a fried place, churches where well, they closing them down, or Popeyes or whatever, and then go get your blood work. Okay, now your cholesterol may be high. You just finished eating fat, fried food, 
So just kind of think about that. Cholesterol and um, glucose is predominantly fasting to get the best result. And then also our lactic acid goes in our uh, oxalate tube and it is to go on ice. You said purple tube finds, uh, what you said about the purple tube found what best work with your blood? Can you repeat what you said for that one? The, I didn't, I don't, I didn't understand your question. Repeat, repeat your question. Which one were you talking about before you talked about the gray one? I'm sure the purple because it comes before the gray. Can you repeat, reiterate what you said about the purple too? I think I missed some things. Well, this is my second time going over it, actually. I was just kind of going over it. So I typically said everything I have in the box here. I was just going over it again because I've already went over it. Um, so, uh, you know, I was just reiterating what I have in my four box here. And just saying what I already said, If you know. I didn't say anything different from the first time. I was oh, just, you said the pink one was for the blood banks. Okay, I got confused. Yeah, and it's on your two-page paper, too, um, to where, you know, um, yeah. So I just kind of went over it twice, you know, back to back. So just to, you know, get it embedded in you, in you, in y'all's mind and you guys' mind. And also you can see right here, it, on the second page of your blood uh, tube, you have your order or draw here. So please write this right here is a prime example of memorizing the order or draw per the color and per the attitude, okay? Sterile is the same thing as blood cultures. You got your sterile blood cultures, citrate, serum, SST, heparin, EDTA, oxalate. And so it's going to, you're going to have, you, your exam is going to have order a draw multiple times. And they're going to ask you the same questions, just in a different way. The most common test that I told you, it is more so for a real life type of event, but you will see the common test on your national exam. So you have to put them in its perspective tubes. Just like how I have separated here from what we already talked about this weekend, just kind of going over it again. Any other questions? <clears throat> Are you confused by the, the lavender and pink top two? Or does it make sense now, Victoria? It makes sense now. I thought that you said the, the purple tube goes to the lab, but I just have to write down the pink tube code. I mean, not blood bank. Pink yeah. tube goes to the blood bank. Okay. Okay. So this is your order of draw. It's very important. Remember, we don't want to go out of the order of draw. So this weekend, when you read your requisition to get your tubes out that I'm going to have you do a little skit with, I need you to put them in the order of draw as if you was ready to draw the patient. That way, when you pick up your tubes, it's already in order, okay? Rather, you do your, your tubes from left to right or right to left. I don't know, whatever works best for you. But I just need you to pick them up in the correct order. I mean, pick them up in order and ready for you to go. We do not want to mix the additives with a tube that it shouldn't be. That's the point of going in the order of draw. You can cause your patient's labs to be all discombobulated, okay, and, and misdiagnosed if the doctor, you know, caught on to it, okay? So I don't know if you do best with flashcards or just writing it down like this. Um, but whatever works best for you to remember the color, the additive, the inversions, and the most common test for those. Okay. Let me show something to you now.
All right. So what I'm showing you right now is these are vacutainer tubes, but if you notice, they really little, they little, and they not really like the big ones that we use, okay? These are called microtainer tubes. You see that on the bottle? Microtainer uh, tubes, blood tubes. If you notice that we have a lavender, we have our green, we have our gold, we have our red, we have our gray. These microtainer tubes, I think we kind of discussed it and I think Victoria had the question. These are the tubes that can take capillary blood from your fingers or from the baby heel, okay? Predominantly is used for babies because they are microtainers, okay? So typically, um, once you take off the top, it's no need to use a vacutainer holder to stick the vacutainer tube in because they are for capillary blood. So you would take off the top and then as the blood drops from your infant heel, it will drop in the tube and you don't need a whole lot. That's why they are microtainers to test your baby's blood, okay? For whatever reason, if an adult is in serious, uh, you know, serious uh, illness or the lab doesn't really have much, I'm not going to ever tell you that you may not ever, you, I'm not going to let you know like, oh, you can't use these on adults. They may use them, but it's just not enough or sufficient blood for adults. That's why it's used for infants, for babies, 12 months, uh, birth to 12 months. Now. Let me tell you something else. If you find yourself using a microtainer tube, do you see how the lavender is first? You probably noticed number one, that it's not really in the order that we just talked about. So let me explain. If you were to draw from your baby, the same tests go in the same colors. So lavender purple, CBC, hemoglobin A1C. Your green is for your stat chemistries that can go in your gold, okay? Go, SST gold is still the same thing. Your oxalate is still the same thing for glucose and lactic acid if the doctor ordered it on the baby, but typically lactic acid won't be ordered on the baby. But I said all that to say, the additive, is in there, but it's, it can't get uh, jumbled up because it's taken from the capillary, it's not taken from the knee. So there is no particular order of draw using these microtainers. You def the only order is, is that if you had a CBC, you need to do your purple first and then you could draw any of the other colors in any order or take it because it's by capillary blood. I just want to show you all, I'm sure at the very beginning of your career, you may not be, you know, uh, having babies, uh, but these are microtainer tubes. They, they, the color represents the same additive as the vacutainer tube. It's just that they don't particularly have an order of draw, only just to draw the lavender first and then the rest of them later. And once you stick your baby heel that we'll talk about over the weekend, the blood would just drop in the tube. And when it's full, up to the full line, you snap the cap back on there and then go about your day and do what you need to do, label it and all that good stuff. The difference between microtainers is that you're not doing it per vena puncture, you're doing it per capillary puncture. These are microtainer tubes. And the main reason why we don't do ven uh, venipunctures on babies is because their veins are too small. So most of the things are gonna be done on capillary. And I don't know if any of you guys seen it, but depending on how small a baby is and if they need IV and if they need IV fluid, you'll see some babies have IVs in their heads because their veins is bigger in their head than it is in their little bitty arms. So that's why for blood work, it comes from, uh, we have to use the microtainers. But 
off in the beginning, you may not, you know, you may not even see them, but I'm just letting you know, okay? So if you have the micro trainer or ever needed to use it, the EDTA tube comes first and the rest of them comes next. It doesn't matter what order. And those are by capillary drops from the capillary puncture, not from using the needle for uh, venipuncture, okay? So just be familiar with what they are. Will you see this on a national exam? The only thing that I can tell you that you may see on a national exam is that if they talk about capillary uh, puncture and these tubes, just know EDTA goes first. You may get that question, you may not. And that's all that's on there for microtainers. But I do want you to be familiar with it to say that you've seen um, the difference of how you collect baby blood versus adult blood. And remember, Victoria, you asked me, well, what's the difference? Why, why do we have to do it that way versus this way? Well, for babies, we do it uh, microtainer, but for adults, a more sufficient amount is needed. So it's done by venipuncture. Okay. Okay. I'm sharing my screen again. I just want to talk about keep your brain refreshed on things to remember when we do a venipuncture. Okay. Try to follow me in your mind. And um, so we can, we can, you know, you can be comfortable. These seven topics right here can be like 20. Nah, I'm not gonna say 20. These seven, seven topics can be probably about 10 to 15 questions. And so um, since it's been since the weekend, since we actually did the venipuncture technique in order, I just wanna go over and reiterate. So when we uh, meet up this weekend, you know, things can kind of be fresh. So things to remember about a tourniquet. Remember that we do need a tourniquet. We definitely need to use it. Remember that the tourniquet always go above the site that, of your choice that you chose three to five inches, as a matter of fact, three to four, three to five inches, okay? So if you're gonna draw in your hand, then it goes three to five inches right here above a person's watch or bracelet. If you're gonna draw in the anti-cubal fossil area, then it's gonna go right up here, which is three to five inches above the area where you draw it. Also, what to remember, never do the best that you can to try not to leave the tourniquet on no more than 60 seconds, which is one minute. Okay. Those are the things to remember about a tourniquet. We definitely need to use it. It goes three to five inches above the site, not to leave on no more than 60, 60 seconds. Ooh, that was all through, what I just said is three questions. So you have to be confident in what I just said. So when you're tested, you'll be able to choose the correct answer, okay? Moving on to what to remember about alcohol being dry. The main thing to remember is to allow it to air dry. Please, don't wave on it, don't blow on it. Al always allow alcohol to air dry and it takes nothing but seconds. That is the only thing that I need you to remember about alcohol. And definitely that we need to use it, okay? We do need to use it. It's a form of aseptic technique to free the area away from any germs or bacteria, okay? We do, when we clean the area, try to go in a circular motion from inner to out. So you can capture the whole area of that aspect of the center of where you're gonna touch. Remember, once you actually touch it and you're ready to stick, do not wipe it with alcohol again, let it drop. Before you insert that needle, the alcohol should have been the last thing that you did before inserting the needle, okay? Three, what to remember about the order of veins? We know that 
we have the medial cubicle vein that lies in the middle, in the inner elbow, basically. We also know that number two, we have the cephalic vein. It lies on the outer edge of our arm, outer. You're gonna see it, outer edge. Don't get confused with inner and outer. The cephalic lies on the outer edge of our arm, okay? When your arm is held like this to draw blood, okay? Third in the order of draw is our basilic vein. It is uh, on the inner aspect of our arm, okay? Under the armpit. It does also go all the way down to the hand, so to speak. Remember, the hand veins have no order. But when you're drawn from the anti-cubal fossil, from uh, uh, the, if you can feel the basilic, just move past it and go to the hands or go to the other arm. Okay, but in the hand, when the basilic comes all the way down here, yeah, you could draw from it. The artery of the nerve is in the anti-cubal fossa area. Okay, medial cubical vein, cephalic vein, basilic vein. All three of them lie in the anti-cubal fossa of the arm, which is our arm facing this way. All right. What to remember about proper needle and tube sizes? Remember, we just talked about microtainers. So microtainers we use on our infants. Infant ages is birth to 12 months. We do know with our needle, the bigger number the needle is really the smaller the needle. The bigger number the needle, uh, the bigger number that the needle is, is the smaller the needle. The smaller the number the needle is, it's really the bigger the needle. Remember our average size needle that we're gonna use on a day-to-day -day venipuncture level is 22 and 21. The needle sizes that you're gonna use if you work in the blood bank is either 16, 17, or 18. They are big needles. You need to know this. They're gonna test you on it. Blood banking needles, 16, 17, 18. Most common uh, size needle for an adult, 22, 21. We would use our 23, which is our little bitty butterfly wingtip needle on someone that has small veins. We don't wanna use a, a big 21, 22 on someone veins that's very small. You are liable to stick them and not get any blood because the, the, the needle is too big for their veins. And typically vice versa. You don't want to use a small needle for a big vein because as soon as you stick that little bitty needle into the area with a big vein, a little blood may seep out of the uh, insertion site because you're using that little bitty vein, I mean that little bitty needle in a big juicy vein. If that happens, it's okay, continue with your, continue with your blood draw, but typically you shouldn't use a small needle for a big vein. So up here in this area, if you're gonna use a butterfly, that's because my vein was probably small. But typically in this area, you wanna use a big needle. I mean, you know, the average size needle, okay? So that's what to remember about proper needle and tube sizes. Remember on somebody vein that can collapse and that's very fragile, you wanna to try to use the syringe technique with the needle on there, with the syringe to where you could pull back, okay? Because the minute that the you use a vacuum tainer too on someone's veins that's fragile and collapse, that vacuum will suck so hard it'll collapse the vein and it'll stop giving you blood. Okay. You said the blood vacuum is what size? 16, 17. You're going up. I can barely hear you. Say it again. I said you said the blood bank needles were what size? 16 and what? 16, 17, and 18. So you would use any one of those three in a blood bank, a, a, a blood banking or plasma center. I know that Griffles, they use 17. All right, moving on down to the five, the angle of insertion of the needle. What's to remember? 15 to 30. Our 15 angle will be more of a big juicy vein that's right on top of the skin. 
we want to be at a 15. So technically I should be straight and I just want to be at a 15 to go right in that juicy vein. Okay. Now for our 30, if I'm 30 like this, that means that my vein is a little deeper. So I need to bring my angle up to go in a little deeper. We're never going to be like this at a 45 because you do that. You go in the vein, you're going straight through the vein. Okay. So remember our angle of insertion of the needle is 15, is a 15 to 30. Okay. Not five, not 10, not 45. Okay. All right, moving on, uh, uh, moving on to six. This is important to remember, meaning that once you're actually finished, your, you, got, you, you receive your blood back, your blood draw from your tubes, you're on your very last tube to collect blood, okay? We want to take out that tube, pop the tourniquet, and then remove the needle to apply the gauze, okay? Remember that. Never take out the tube and the needle together and never take out the needle before you pop the tourniquet. You're going to have a blood pool bath <laughs> in the lab. So remember, remove the tube, pop the tourniquet, re then remove the needle, and then you're ready to apply your gauze for pressure to create hemostasis. Next, remember to give your patient a uh, proper post care. You know, once you created hemostasis and you looked, no more bleeding, you apply the band aid or the, the tape. Then you want to tell them to leave it on for at least 15 to 20 minutes and not to pick up anything heavy within that time. If you do witness that you started bleeding again, please call your doctor's office or call 911. They're not going to call you just because you drew your blood, their blood. They're not going to call you. They need to call 911 or their doctor. Okay. So be sure that you give them post, you know, care instructions. If it is someone that's older, you know, just kind of show a little bit of empathy and help them up or tell them to get up a little slowly because you just finished drawing their blood. So they shouldn't get up so fast to where they may fall and come back down again. So instruct your patient, okay, get up slowly. Thank you so much. And this is after you already showed them the label to verify that everything is correct, okay? So these are important tips to remember during your venipuncture. And literally, those were proper. I mean, of course, I didn't give you the question with answers. But what I mean is, what I just went over, they're going to test your knowledge on that, okay, in that way with the tourniquet, with the alcohol, with the order of veins, with the needle sizes, with the angles, with your tech, with, with your order as far as removing your tube, popping your tourniquet, removing the needle versus post-care instructions, okay? Any questions with what to remember when we're, when we're doing this stuff? Okay. All right. So what I want to do now is get into special collections. It's 7:45. The video uh, is uh, I am showing a video with it, and the video is roughly uh, approximately. 851. And so special collections is important. Um, it talks about different things. Um, don't, you know, just, just do your best to take heat, listen, and then I'm going to go back over it and explain the different areas of the special collection. Okay. So give me one moment. Let me get the video together. <clears throat> This will, this will take us out for tonight with the special collections. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen.
another PowerPoint presentation by Phlebotomy Solutions. In this PowerPoint presentation, we'll be looking at special blood collection procedures. Let's begin with bilirubin. What is bilirubin? Bilirubin is described as a yellow-orange substance, which results from the breakdown of hemoglobin. Now, bilirubin is a waste product from the breakdown of old red blood cells, which is processed by the liver for removal from the body. Abnormally high bilirubin levels are often indicative of liver disease. The result is jaundice, yellow skin, and yellow in the white of the eyes. Now, what would be the purpose of this test? Well, one, we will be determining liver disease. Another would determine blockage in the bile duct. And another is neonatal jaundice. And again, every, all these are all associated with issues with the liver. And some of the precautions we need to take when drawing this type of blood sample or checking for high bilirubin levels, we need to minimize exposure to light. That is referring to the blood sample itself. When we are done collecting the blood, we need to minimize exposure to the light. This is a sensitive test, and we need to make sure that we keep it light exposure to the bare minimum. And by doing so, we might be using some light blocking amber colored containers. Or if we don't have that, we can use aluminum foil to wrap around the tube immediately to again to prevent the minimum exposure to light. Now let's talk about the glucose tolerance test, which we test for high or low sugar in the body. And the administration of glucose to, is to determine how quickly it is cleared from the blood. Now the reasons or some of the reasons for the test being ordered is one to check for glucose levels checking for diabetes, insulin resistance, and a basic insulin overview of typically glucogen. Now, the test is usually used to test for diabetes and the things listed, and the glucose is most often given orally, so the common test is technically an oral glucose tolerance test, or an OGTT. And the test may be performed as part of a panel test, such as a comprehensive metabolic panel. And again, we evaluate body's ability to metabolize the glucose or the sugar. Now that is referred to usually typically as hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. And hyper is the high and the hypo is the low. Think of it this way. When you give your ch children a lot of sugar, they become, we say, hyper, hyperactive. Well, hyper is high. So hyperglycemia is high sugar while the hypo is low sugar. And if you can see, sometimes it requires certain... Uh, things like uh, no food or drinks for 8 to 12 hours prior to the test. And then they drink the glucose and the blood is tested two hours later. And of course, high glucose levels is potential for diabetes. So again, this is the gluc glucose tolerance test. Now let's talk about the preparation and procedures. One is balanced meals. Now the doctor might request the patient to have a certain uh, meal time cutoff, let's say nothing after eight o'clock. And before that, maybe a balanced meal of certain types of foods to eat uh, that they want the patient to do before they cut off the meal, or even afterward, what they can and cannot eat afterward. And typically, uh, the water intake is also mentioned that they might have a little bit of water or none. Now, typically, they might have, they're able to drink just a little bit or sips of water that will not uh, harm the test at all if they're on an 8 to 12 hour fast. So water is usually typically good, just not cups of water, but sipping water is okay. Also, this might require an 8 or 12 hour fast, depends what the doctor's ordered. So again, follow the physician's protocol on uh, preparation and procedures. And again, we want to make sure that there's no eating, there's also no smoking, no gum chewing, or caffeine of any kind, etc. Uh, if they're in an 8 to 12 hour fast, this is important because again, this can change the results of the test. And of course, we draw the blood two hours after they drink uh, the cola or the uh, glucose cola you see on the screen. And typically it can be done also in intervals as well. And the other important thing is knowing when to stop the test. Now, typically we don't as phlebotomists stop any test. We need to get typically a doctor's permission to go ahead and cancel any tests that we've done. Now, this might happen because after the uh, patient has drinking the cola, they might get uh, nauseous and even throw up or feel sick to the stomach, and this might cause us to have to stop and uh, put a test for a future date. But again, we need to contact the doctor and let them know the situation. 
or after they drink the cola, they eat something or do something they're not supposed to do that could also cause the test to be stopped and done for a future date. But again, we must also typically consult the physician, let them know that there's a problem with the test and he will give the final uh, say if we should stop the test or he might want to continue and take the blood test anyway. So always consult the physician before canceling or stopping any glucose test. Now let's talk about blood cultures and why a doctor will order blood cultures. One reason is to check for septicemia. If a patient comes in with the symptoms of fever, chills, or tachycardia, the doctor will order blood cultures to determine if there is a bacterial infection that's circulating through the blood throughout the body. Now, if there's no symptoms, but the doctor suspects that there might be a bacterial infection, the doctor will check for bacteremia. And again, we might also check for an antibiotic sensitivity on the patients. This is what is used typically for blood cultures. Now, in doing so, we use two blood culture bottles, an aerobic and anaerobic. And typically these are timed uh, tests. We might have to go back for a second set. So what you would do is you'd go in with the uh, two bottles of aerobic and anaerobic and draw from this particular venipuncture site, and then come back 15, 20 minutes later to collect another set from a different venipuncture site altogether. You will never draw from the same venipuncture site you did for the first initial blood cultures. And if you're drawing a neonate or an infant, you will use an aerobic bottle only. Unless the doctor suspects an anaerobic infection, you will use an aerobic bottle. And that usually comes with a pink top instead of a lavender or a red. And when you prep the site, you will use a chloroprep wipe, not an alcohol prep pad. A chloroprep wipe is used. And after you do that, you will never repalpate the site. And again, no repalpating after you use the chloroprep wipe for a blood culture collection. Now let's talk about therapeutic drug monitoring. Evaluate and manage medication therapy. Now, this is determined if the medication that the patient is on is too weak or too toxic for the patient. And also we do types of blood level checks, which is usually a trough level, when the drug level in blood is collected, when the lowest serum concentration is expected. That is usually just before the next dose and also peak levels. And this is usually 15 to 30 minutes after the medication has been given. The highest level of drug is expected at that time. Now let's talk about toxicology screening. This can be done with blood or urine. And we would measure legal and illegal substances through blood or urine. And of course, we have to make sure we take right preparations to do so. We need to get consent from the patient. Now this can come also uh, from a court order if the patient is suspected of something of an illegal activity, uh, DUI, or some kind of accident that the police officer might have suspected the patient to be on some kind of drugs. We need a court order consent. We also need a chain of custody. And the said chain of custody form is added onto as the test specimen travels from person to person that gives complete accountability of a test sample as well as a list of medications. So when you also need a list of medication the patient might be on to determine outside of the legal or illegal substances and be able to measure that out. Thank you and this is the end of special. All right, so before your brains be like, oh my God, what did we just listen to? Um, with this being said, First thing is first, I want you guys, when it talks about Billy Rubin, it just basically gave a, uh, a background on Billy Rubin. If you have a Billy Rubin order that you need to draw on someone, a baby or an adult, it simply just means that the doctor's checking more in depth to someone's liver, okay? We talked about hepatic panel and I told you that's the same word for liver. Well, Billy Rubin it is what lies in someone's liver. And sometimes you may get people, you've probably seen it in real life or on a movie where some people eyes, the white part of the eyes will be yellow. That means that they have, they could have a, a liver condition. And so the doctor needs to see what's going on. And typically it could be because they have too much Billy Rubin. That's just a background on Billy Rubin. 
okay? You're not going to be tested in what is Billy Rubin and what does it do to the body and all this. You're not going to be tested with that. But I needed you to understand the background of Billy Rubin in order to know what's going on. So if you do have a lab order to where um, you have to collect a Billy Rubin on someone, this particular level is special. And the reason why it's in this segment of special collections is because when you do um, collect it, this blood cannot be under light at all. So the clear bags that we have in class, it's, it's, a, it's the biohazard bag but the clear part is really clear. These Billy Rubin level, levels cannot go in those kind of bags. They need to go in a biohazard bag, but the biohazard bag needs to be a bag that is, has a tent that protects from light. So, excuse me. So instead of it being the clear part, it'll have like a pinkish tint to it. That just means that bag is a bag that will protect your specimen from light. I don't know for those of you that had children or maybe had a niece or nephew that had jaundice when they were born. And so they had to sit under this light, okay? For this particular light to penetrate through their skin to correct the jaundice. But eyes cannot be visible to the light, you know, because it can damage, you know, in a way. So it's the same difference with the blood. The blood cannot be accessible to light. It needs to be protected. So what I need you to remember is that if you have Billy Rubin checked on your requisition, you draw it in the appropriate tube that it goes in, that it's going to tell you on the side, which is typically going to be a SST but you don't have to remember that right now. What you need to remember from a Billy Rubin is that it needs to be protected from light. That's what you have to remember. Please remember. So whatever uh, supplies uh, that your lab have, rather it has a light blocking amber colored container or bag, or they may, see, they may still use fall paper. That's what they used back in the day but I have not seen that used in a while, just know that that specimen needs to be protected from light. So if your lab, if you work for a small lab and you guys run out of the bags that is protected from light, then go ahead and get some fall paper. You know, it is what it is. You know, it needs to be protected. Meaning if light hits it, let's just say you worked real quick. You didn't think that any light hit it. You, you think that, you know, it needs to be protected from light, minimum exposure to light. So let's just say you had the specimen and you went in another room just to package it up. It was minimum exposure. Hopefully it didn't destroy the sample. So technically what that means is, is that the same thing like for uh, hemolyzed blood and hemoconcentration blood, by the time it gets to the lab, if that Billy Rubin can't be tested and the, the proper components that's in that blood, if they can't see it, then they're going to say, oh, um, this blood specimen, we can't, you know, we, we, we can't use it. It needs to be drawn again. So the only way for you to know is that if they tell you that they can't use the specimen. But I just need you to know when it comes to Billy Rubin, as a fundamental phlebotomist entry level in the beginning, you just need to know if you see Billy Rubin and you draw it, draw it in the tube that it goes in, draw it in the order of draw that it goes in, but when you package it up, it needs to be protected from light in that bag, okay? While it's waiting for the carrier to the lab to come pick it up, and when they take it to process it, okay? Billy Rubin needs to be minimum exposure to light. Basically, the doctor is checking out the, the person's liver, okay? That's all. That's what it is. But still, it needs to be protected from light. That is the only and main thing I need you to remember about Billy Rubin levels when you draw it, okay? Any questions about Billy Rubin? Okay. Now moving forward to this particular one that is called a glucose tolerance test. 
Either it's going to be spelled out the way that it is, or it's going to say GTT, glucose tolerance test. We should all know now that glucose is another word for sugar. So this is a special collected test because <clears throat> for those of you that have, that, that have had children, for sure, in your eighth month, you will do this test because the doctor is trying to see if you have diabetes while you're carrying your baby to see if your baby will also have this when he or she is born. Other people get it done too, but this is one of those most that I talked about and that I can um, explain. So what it is is that you have to be fasting literally at least eight to 10, eight to 12 hours, no less than eight, no more than 12, basically. You be fasting. And then when you go into the phlebotomy, you guys are going to give your patient one of these looking drinks like this. It'll either be Coca-Cola flavor, orange flavor, lime flavor, or they may have other type of flavors. What it is, is that this is a big old bottle of sugar is what it is. So on a fasting state, nothing to eat or drink, you would go into the lab. I would go into the lab. You will identify me, do what you need to do. And then you say, okay, Ms. Chopin, the doctor has ordered a glucose tolerance test. I see that's why you're here. The lab will carry these drinks in your lab, in the refrigerator. You will give me one of these drinks that is disgusting, but I would have to drink the whole drink and sit in your waiting room for at least two hours before you draw my blood. A glucose tolerance test means the doctor has ordered this to see how much your body can tolerate sugar to really give you that diagnosis if you're diabetic while you're pregnant. So technically, while you're sitting for those two hours, we have a pancreas, we have all these st this stuff, all of these organs that can help us get rid of that sugar. If we don't get rid of the sugar or not as much as the doctor want us to, when you draw the patient blood, whatever results come back, that is not your responsibility. The doctor you know, uh, knows what's high, what's low, what's normal the doctor will be able to diagnose the patient or not diagnose the patient if it's normal. So this is a special collection because you would give them a drink that they, and then after they drink it, they would have to wait in the lobby for two hours. They're not gonna go home, walk their dog, go home, wash their hair, come back. No, because they still not supposed to have nothing to eat or drink. So typically if you, uh, if you clock in to work and you see that you have some patients that is already like on, on a schedule or routine or have an appointment to come in for a glucose tolerance test, just know that that patient is going to be in there for a while. Because once they drink it, they have to wait two hours anyway. Then you draw their blood after they wait it. Okay, so moving it back a little bit, it is checking for diabetes, insulin resistant, meaning if your body can if your body is giving insulin or not giving insulin, that's something of, you know, that the doctors do. But what I want you to realize and recognize what glucose tolerance test is, GTT, where you would give the patient the sugary drink and they would drink it. After two hours, you would draw their blood. In whatever color tube it go in, you can even look at your requisition and some of them have glucose tolerance tests, which... They would go in a gray top too, by the way. Okay. And you would do it in the order of draw, put it in the right tube. And it doesn't have to be packaged special, no, not on ice, not protected from light. The reason why this is a special collection test because of the way that you had to collect it. You give them a drink, they have to wait, and then you draw their blood after two hours. <clears throat> they had to be fasting, nothing to eat or drink. Okay, the same difference of a regular uh, a routine blood work that says fasting. Okay, and I know you see here it says avoid chewing gum, smoking, and caffeine. How do you know that a patient really had it 
You just have to take their word for it. You know, I could be a gum chewer. The moment I brush my teeth, I pop a gum in my mouth, you know, but when I came to you, I didn't have a gum. But when you asked me if I was fasting, I said yes. And when you asked me when the last time I had something to eat or drink, I said last night at four o'clock, you know, typically gum, even though that they could be um, sugar free, it's just that you don't want nothing to get trapped in the saliva to where it gets into someone's system just like smoking and nicotine. So you just smoke the cigarette, then you drunk this sugary stuff. So now the nicotine is going in with the stuff. So I know that it's a little bit far-fetched. You're like, well, how am I supposed to remember all that or tell the patient? Just, you know, it'll come, it'll just come to mind. But the smoking and gum, I mean, it's people that smoke all the time and didn't eat and you still draw their blood. You know, it's, it, I don't even think it really messed with them like that. But the rule of thumb is that it tells the pet, try to tell the patient to avoid any smoking. So if they drink the sugary drink and they waiting for two hours, and let's just say, hopefully it's not a pregnant woman, but it's a, somebody else that's getting it done because the doctor ordered. And they ask you, can I go outside to smoke a cigarette? Tell them, no, you have to wait until after your, your blood, we draw your blood, okay? Can I pop in the gum? I'm hungry, I'm hungry. No, wait until after we draw your blood work, okay? Let's just say I drink it so fast and I feel like I got to throw up as I'm drinking. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this today. I don't want to do this today. You do not have the right to say, okay, Ms. Chopin, I understand. You know, we'll just mark that you didn't come and come back tomorrow. Now, you can't make me, you know, stay there. But what I'm saying is, because this is a special collection type of thing, someone needs to call the doctor's office to let them know, okay, Ms. Chopin says she has to throw up. She cannot continue to take this today. Is it okay that we allow her to come back tomorrow? And then whatever the nurse from that doctor's office say or that doctor tell you, you proceed, which they're gonna tell you, yeah, because no one can make anyone do anything. Okay, you cannot, no matter how hard that the patient needs this test, if I say I don't want to do it because I'm about to throw up, you know, um, you, you can't make me stay, but you just need to communicate with the doctor's office. Okay, so that's why this particular section say you cannot tell the patient when to stop the test. You have to let the doctor do that. Okay, blood work is drawn two hours after the test. After the blood work is drawn, they can go home and eat all the Olive Garden or the Golden Corral they want. Your job is done. <laughs> Buffet, okay? So moving forward to the next, <clears throat> which was blood cultures. And I, I kind of went a little deeper into blood cultures when I did the order of draw. What we know is, is that it's two bottles. One is aerobic, which is with oxygen. One is anaerobic which is without oxygen. We also know that the reason why the doctor is even doing the blood culture is to check what kind of bacteria the patient even has. Medical terminology, the doctor is checking for bacteremia and septicemia. Septis meaning did the bacteria attack, get to the organs. Bacteria, I mean, uh, bacteria, which is another name for bacteremia, means it'll tell you that if the bacteria just got to the blood. But if somebody has an infection for so long, it'll go bypass the blood and start attacking someone's organs. And that's what septis is, septicemia. So on your national exam, you will see these two words, bacteremia and septicemia. So if I ask you, if I'm the doctor and I wanna check bacteremia on a patient, what blood tubes do I need or what supplies do I need? Hopefully you tell me, oh, you need two blood culture bottles for that. If I say, okay, well, I want to check her out to, to see if she is septic, see if this bacteria got to her, got to her organs. I'm trying to see if she has septicemia. What type of equipment do I need or supplies do I need? Hopefully you'll tell me, oh, you need the blood culture bottles. Okay. We already know about the antibiotic sensitivity. That's the code that goes with the culture. So therefore to tell the doctor what can help me, what antibiotic I need to get rid of this bacteria, okay? That's lying in my skin and could possibly attack my organs. 
okay? I did mention we need two blood culture bottles. Now, going to the core prep. Chloroprep is the same word as that chlorhexidine gluconate that you all looked at this weekend. Chloroprep is just a different brand name for it. So just like how we had Hippoclens, and I think the other one was named Right Aid Skin Cleanser, but the ingredient in it was chlorhexidine gluconate. So this is just another brand, Chloroprep which has chlorhexidine gluconate. So when we talk about using alcohol, this is one of the cases where you would not clean my site with alcohol. You would clean my site with chloroprep, with chlorhexidine gluconate for blood culture. And it's okay if you have blood tubes that need to follow the blood culture, that's fine. You know, it's just that if you do have the blood culture, you clean the site with chloroprep. Another thing, if alcohol, if an alcohol level is checked on your um, requisition, I think I said this, but in case I didn't, if an alcohol level is checked on your requisition, you also do not use alcohol to clean here. You use the chlorhexidine gluconate. Even though we are allowing the alcohol, the alcohol to air dry, for an actual alcohol level, you don't want to jeopardize anything with that alcohol level for that level to be higher than normal just because you clean that site with alcohol, uh, alcohol pad. So not to use alcohol when we have blood cultures and when we have an order for an alcohol level, okay? Use your chloroprep. So this is what's special about blood cultures. I've already told you that five milliliters of blood go in each bottle. We do need both. You did hear him say for pediatrics, we only need one bottle, which is the aerobic bottle. Until you work in a pediatric clinic, as a matter of fact, I do know I have two, two students. She told me, they told me that, oh, I don't know what happened. They told me, that in their lab, there is cheat notes everywhere to tell you what tubes to use and the blood cultures and things of that nature. So um, I know that once you get put out in the real world, not only will they train you and orient you, the lab will have all kinds of stuff. And you can bring stuff to help you remember, like that order drawer card that I gave you, attach that to your badge, have your notes, whatever the case may be. Just know that you're not going to be thrown to the wolves. So if you do forget that one bottle is needed for pediatrics, you'll be reminded because before you get released by yourself, and let's just say your lab do see pediatrics, pediatrics a lot, a lot. I, you I will be trained with another uh, phlebotomist. So you will be walking with him or her and you will get the feel of things. Someone had a question? Yeah, this is Shamanica. So you were saying that for the blood cultures that infants only need one bottle, um, but out of the two bottles, which one do they use? Because one is um, a, 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 aerobic, which is with oxygen and anaerobic, which is without. Yeah, I said aerobic. That's the one aerobic. you need for okay, PDF. Uh -huh. okay. No, you good. Aerobic. The one with oxygen is the one that the pediatrics need only. Right. Mm -hmm. And like the video said, you see how this is kind of like a lavender purple. I don't know. But for pediatrics, it's typically, their color is going to typically be pink. That aerobic bottle is going to be pink. And your lab will tell you, even when it comes to the ages, because no one has asked me, but you're probably like, well, what's the age for pediatric? Because pediatric is really, you know, to me, birth through all the way up to 17 years. They will train you to know just long as you remember that only one bottle is used for pediatrics. But it's really just really babies you know, because a 13 year old and up and all of that, they would need to know both, you know, if they have sepsis or a bacteria. But with blood cultures, I do need you to know that it's two bottles always accompanied. 
We don't clean the site with alcohol. We clean it with chlorhexidine gluconate. Another word is chloroprep. And the doctor is checking for bacteria and septicemia. And this is for this someone, is for someone that is sick and ill. You know, that's why I said you won't see it like a lot, multiple times every day. You won't be having it every patient. But if you do have it, just know that, okay, well, this patient, the doctor, you know, think that she or he has something. Okay, we're getting to the end. This is a big component. Now, this is another special collections to where has anyone ever been on any medication or uh, know anyone that even is taking mental medications, behavior, psych meds, as they're calling. So sometimes you may you may say oh she crazy she must be off her meds oh the doctor needs to go up on his meds or her meds you know there is a such thing as the doctor monitoring your medication to know if it's too weak or if it's too much if it's too toxic so what I need you to remember when it comes to these, this little area, evaluate and manage medication therapy, either too weak or too toxic. Type of blood levels is either trough level or peak level. So as a phlebotomist, you will see on your requisition, it will say trough level or peak level. What that means is a trough level is before the medication was taken. So the doctor want to know what your level is before this medication is given. A peak level is after the medication was given. So now the doctor knows, okay, Ms. Chopin level was this before she took it. Now it's this after she took it. I still need her to have a little bit more in her system. Okay. So they are monitoring your drug pattern. They are monitoring the drug to see if it's working for you. So if y'all didn't know it was a such thing, it is a such thing. The doctor doing trough and peak levels to know if a medication is working for someone. Okay. It is a such thing to be too weak and too much. So let's just say you did a peak level on me and the results came in and the results is too high. And the doctor say, oh, we got to cut back on her stuff. Okay, so what's special about it is, is that the reason why it's a special collection is because yes, trough level is before the medication. Peak level is after. But you're probably thinking, okay, uh, we're not medication, we're not nurses, we're not gonna give them their medicine. And you're right. So if you are a phlebotomist in the hospital, you need to communicate with the nurse. Okay, well, when is Ms. Chopin medication due? Because I have a trough level. You will call down to the nurse's station. And then they'll tell you, oh, it's due at 8 o'clock tonight. So that'll let you know to go down about 7.15, 7.30, because it's always 30 minutes at least before, and take my, take my blood. Let's just say it's already known that it's a peak, a trough and a peak that you need. So you went to draw the trough because that was before. And so then you'll, you'll tell the nurse like, okay, well, you give me it to her at eight, then I'll be back at nine to take her blood level. For medication that is taken by mouth, it takes uh, up to an hour to take effect. So uh, uh, typically around one to two hours, you would go at least at one hour, okay? to do that peak level. So what I need you to know is that for therapeutic drug monitoring, just write trough level before medicine given, peak level after medicine was given. Know that you would need to know what time the patient even took the medicine to even know uh, when to draw the trough or when to draw the peak. That's what I need you to know and to understand with therapeutic drug monitoring. No trough is before, no peak is after. And you also have to know when did the patient take the medicine to draw either one of them. 
Did I lose anyone talking about therapeutic drug monitoring? I have a question. Uh-huh. So with levels, what are they testing? Like, what do you mean by levels? Like what kind of test are they doing? Not what kind what? of test. Basically, like, what kind of tube does it go in? So what are they? So no. it, de it depends. It depends on what the medicine is. So let's say, for example, <clears throat> good question. <clears throat> let's say, for example, you have a patient that is on psych meds and they're taking lithium or they're taking uh, pro, uh, uh, yeah, Prozac or something like that. So when the doctor orders a therapeutic drug level and they say Prozac trough level, so you're drawing a Prozac trough level, you're, you're drawing a Prozac level before you give it to them or a or after. So it's going to be on your requisition and it'll tell you like everything else, if it goes in what tube it goes in and then you'll just put it in the order of draw. So ain't nothing changed with what tubes it goes in. You just read your requisition because remember it's going to be checked. So you read your requisition to, to see what it is, okay? But the levels that is checking is pertaining to the medication that they're on. For example, another example, vancomycin is an antibiotic, a strong antibiotic. And so the doctor may want to do a peak, a trough level and a peak level on that patient to make sure they're not giving you too much of this antibiotic because it is very strong and potent. Okay. So the levels that is drawn depends on what the medication is. If it's a lithium, another psych med, then it'll be a lithium level but it'll be a lithium trough level. It'll say that on your requisition. It'll say lithium peak level, okay? And you just match it up with the, uh, match it up with the tube that your requisition says. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. So it's just simply monitoring the drug that that person is on to be sure that they're getting enough, okay? And once the doctor finds the level that works for that patient, then they'll be done monitoring it because now they found the level for the patient, okay? So it is a such thing with these drugs, okay? Now, I will probably talk about this a little bit more over the weekend, but toxicology screening. We know toxicology is the study of toxins. We know toxins is too much. Anything that's going to the toxicology lab is basically too much of something. So let's just say uh, something happens, somebody gets pulled over while driving drunk, what they call it now, DWI, driving while intoxicated. But then somebody can be pulled over and get a DUI, driving under the influence, probably of drugs. But let's just say something happened, you got in a wreck and the other person, you know, that person, you know, passed away, was dead on scene, dead on arrival. Or let's just say you got in an accident, you got pulled over. I'm saying all that to say is you can have, somebody can order an alcohol level regular, regular, a drug test regularly. But if you have to go to court and the doctor orders you to have a blood, an alcohol blood test or a drug test, or let's just say, you and your husband went through a bad divorce. All of a sudden, he says, she ain't mine. So now the, the court then ordered a DNA test. They, the court ordered it. And let's just say you had a family member. Uh, I'm going to use it. Uh, so you had a family member to pass away. And in the will, it says, all of my grandkids get this amount of money. And... Um, all of a sudden, a grandkid come out of nowhere that nobody knows. And so now it's legalized because this is a will. Then the court needs to, they will order a DNA test. A DNA and a paternity test is not exactly the same. It is the, the there's paternity within the DNA, but the DNA goes down the family line. So it's, it, it's more in detail. So I said all this to say, 
if the judge or any labs is ordered from the courts, it is accompanied by one of these forms right here that's called a chain of custody. Have you ever seen Law and Order SVU? Because that's my favorite. Law and Order SVU or anything else where they talk about the specimen has been tampered with, you know? So with that being said, anything that's ordered by the courts, and I'm going to tell you, it's not just anything. It's going to be these four things. It's going to be a DNA test, a paternity test, an alcohol test, and a drug test. Once, if any one of those is ordered by the courts, it needs to be accompanied. It's, it's a legal matter now. So it, it's going to have a different form attached with the requisition that's called a chain of custody form. Let me show you. This is in similar, let me try to make it big. This is a similarity of a chain of custody form. It means that, let's just say the doctor ordered an alcohol a blood alcohol test on me because of the DWI I've gotten. And so what that means is that you will still have a requisition that's checked uh, uh, drug test or whatever, or alcohol level. You will still have to make sure whatever lab you work in, you get the patient's consent. And then now you will have a chain of custody form. This form means everybody who touched that specimen has to sign this form so we can eliminate any faulty things that could have happened to that. If something comes out to where the specimen is not the right temperature for the drug test or the specimen has leaked out and not enough blood or whatever, they'll know who all handled it. So for example, I'm coming in um, as the patient that needs the alcohol test, okay? So we don't have no, we don't have the specimen yet. I'm coming in. You look at, you know, my requisition, get my consent, you identify me, blah, blah, blah. So, Miss Monica, you are the phlebotomist. So you would do what you got to do. Your technique, nothing changed. Whatever tube the blood goes in, put it in the order of draw, nothing changes with that. It's just that this particular one is accompanied by a chain of custody form. So you would sign your name, time it on the sheet, your initials, blah, blah, blah. Let's just say, okay, now Victoria takes the specimen to put it in the centrifuge machine. So once she works with that specimen, she too needs to take this chain of cut because the, the, the form follows the specimen in the, with the bag, with the requisition and everything. So she needs to sign and date it that she touched that specimen, okay? Let's just say, Shaughnessy, you're the carrier, you're the phlebotomist that they got you going from facility to facility, picking up the specimens. Because you touched the specimen to bring it to the lab, now you have to sign this chain of custody form to say that you touched it or handled it in some kind of way. And then let's just say, you know, Shamanica or Miss Dinah, y'all take it from Shaughnessy because now you're at the lab. You take it for Shaughnessy and then go ahead and give it to the medical director. Both of y'all have to also sign it to say that you touched it. So this form will follow the specimen from person to person until it's opened up and the, and, and the person who does the uh, results uh, is done. And it's only for court order stuff. So let's just say the doctor did order a drug test, but it wasn't ordered through the courts then you don't need a chain of custody. This chain of custody is only for legal purposes. Paternity DNA, um, paternity DNA drug test and alcohol test. I know that we one minute over. Does anybody have a uh, question about DNA? Chain of custody form is a legally ordered, it's legally ordered through the court system. DNA, paternity, alcohol, and drug. Those are the only four that could be ordered through the courts.
because it's toxicology, too much of whatever. Okay, any questions with that? So toxicology is normally something that's ordered to court only. No, if it's ordered through the courts, then it needs a chain of custody form. But a, a, a doctor can, can see you like you can be having problems. And if the doctor order alcohol uh, level and he, and because he know you drink too much or whatever the case may be, he can order the alcohol level, but it's going to go to the toxicology. But just because it wasn't, it wasn't, it doesn't have to be ordered through the courts to go to the toxicology. But if it is ordered through the courts, you the only difference between the two is that order through the courts needs a chain of custody form. It's going to go to the toxicology department no matter what. But if the court, if the judge order it, uh, you just need to accompany that, accompany it with a chain of custody form. You just know toxicology is too much of anything. So a drug test, alcohol test, is gonna normally go to the toxicology on a normal, on, on, on a regular basis. We I just separated or added to toxicology if the if the judge orders one of these things, then it needs to have a chain of custody form. Uh-huh. You have a question, Miss Monica? Oh, uh, can we get a copy of this? A copy of what? This paper here. Oh, the whiteboard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you screenshot it? Because it's not a paper, it's just a but the other part missing out, the, the square. You have to what you hit on it first. Okay, there it is. It came back up. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, I know we're three minutes over. And again, I know today was uh, a lot of information. Uh, the, the order of draw was me reiterating what I said on Sunday and getting you, you know, um, you know, more familiar with it. Um, remember, this is re recorded, uh, which makes me remember to stop it now. Um... Uh...